Sales is the lifeblood of your business and your ability to scale depends on the quality of your sales team. But here's a problem. Not everybody's cut out for sales. Now, I have recruited thousands of people across the country to build a sales team in many different cities across the country. And let me tell you, there are some key traits of people that you want on your team and people that you need off your sales team. There are key traits that separate those that are great and horrible. So in this video, I'm going to break down the five key traits of qualities and traits that you need to look for in your sales team. And on the flip side, I'm gonna share the five key traits that you need to avoid at all costs in your consideration for them being and hiring them for your sales team. All right, so let's get started here in three, two, one, let's go. Let's get this money. Bills, get in this let's get this money. One yen, better know I'm on it. What's cracking everybody? Money Smart Guy, Matt Cipolla here, hailing to you from Dallas, Texas. And once again, we got an episode here for you to build your sales, your sales team, and obviously your sales leadership in scaling your business to become a seven-figure, eight-figure, nine-figure type of business. Let's get into trait number one, resilience. What is resilience? Here's the definition. Resilience means that person bounces back stronger after failure. They treat every no as a step closer to a yes, and they thrive under pressure. See, everybody's looking for the salesperson that can close, 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 and it's an awesome day, it's an awesome week, it's an awesome year. But you know the person I look for? I look for somebody that says, you know what? I may have wins too, but I also know how to deal with the times that I don't sell or times that I get charged back or times that customers have something negative to say about me or the process of my company. I found that most people, when they have a little butt hurt, a little tendencies to have their feelings hurt, that those people either find themselves and a character rises up to see if they're wired for sales because that resilience the ability to fight through. That's the type of character I want. I want people to be celebrated, not during the good days, that's easy. I want people to be celebrated, pushed through on the bad days, especially when things don't go their way. Quality here to look for in all your sales guys is resilience. How do they handle a loss? Do they get bitter or do they get better? Second one, relentless self-improvement. Let me define this. They're constant learners, they're reading, listening and analyzing, always on their game. They're never satisfied with being good enough. And they're always asking, what could I do better? How can I improve? Long time ago, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar and uh, yes, right, how many, by the way, how many co-walkers are out there, huh? How many fire walkers are out there watching this right now? By the way, if you're a fire walker, if you walked across the hot coals and I unleashed the power within Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins seminar, put in the comment section below. I wanna know how many other fire walkers are out there too as well. But Tony Robbins shared a acronym for me I'll never forget. It's C-A-N-I, constant and never ending improvement. You see, in the game of sales, there's a lot of fundamentals and basic over and over and over again to sell a product, to find a pain, create a solution, close a transaction, follow up, make sure you deliver your product or service. For some people, they try to get sophisticated. Being in sales means that how do I still do the basic fundamentals of selling my product or service and still work on my personal development? Do you know why? Because after a while, things potentially might get boring. Matter of fact, that was advice that Patrick Ben David told me a long time ago when I first started my career at PHP Agency. He said, Sapala's, please continue to march. Just don't get bored, okay? So I asked the follow-up question because we do weekly meetings with Patrick Ben David to, for our mastermind session as we built our company, PHP Agency, and we had an exit in July 2022 for nearly $300 million. I asked him a few years later after he gave me an advice, I said, PBD, what do you mean by me getting bored? What do you mean by my wife and I getting bored in the fundamentals of the business and selling transaction? By the way, we were kidding everybody's tail at the time. We made a lot of growth, a lot of impact to the company. He says, so Paul, you're saying you're not getting bored? I said, PBD, I don't know what you're talking about. Our team's growing. We're promoting a lot of people. A lot of people around us are making money. What do you mean by us getting bored? I don't understand. Where was I supposed to get bored? You know, PBD says, <laughs> outstanding. That's the answer I wanted. Do you know why? Because the constant and never ending improvement philosophy to continue to hone the fundamentals doesn't get boring for those that wanna go from good to great to set apart to doing the impossible. If you're looking for somebody, a quality on your sales team, somebody that's constantly working on their game. I had people sometimes take my uh, videos and they transcribe and they role play the transcription amongst each other. They're constantly working on the fundamentals. I have this acronym called Entrepathly. I have this hashtag, I have this t-shirt called Entrepathly. Do you know why? Because I wanna treat business like sport. Meaning, if athletes are out there working out, eating right, studying film, guess what I am doing as an entrepreneur? 
I'm doing the same thing. Yeah, my body doesn't get broken down, but guess what? Sometimes the emotional stress can get to your physical stress. And if you don't have a lot of high energy and you're constantly improving, you get bogged down. So if you find somebody on your team that's constantly self-improving and relentless about constant and never ending self-improvement, you got yourself there at gym. You need to do everything you can to keep them on your team. Third one, accountability. Let me define this. They own the results, good or bad, no excuses. They have a mindset of ownership. And might I add, accountability also has extreme amount of discipline. That's what I, that's right, discipline. You guys don't like that word, do you? But guess what? You may not like that word, but I promise you, you're going to love the results. You're gonna love the results for yourself. You're gonna love the results for your, your sales team. And here's the thing about accountability. Get everybody on a leader's bulletin. Make sure that everybody has a good leader's bulletin and they're competing. And by the way, it sounds fundamental, doesn't it? Back to point number two. It sounds boring, but have you innovated and improved your leader's bulletin. What's sexy about your leader's bulletin? What's your monthly contests? What's your quarterly contests? What's your annual contests? What's the bonuses? What's the trips? What's the exciting part about being on your sales team because I'm being held accountable? You want people to be loving accountability and for them to feel weird if they're not getting any call outs or any competition or anybody self imposing their discipline upon them. And here's the thing too about accountability. In your environment, in your culture, in your building your sales team and your staff, if you're the only one holding people accountable, you don't have a sales team. You got a bunch of individuals. You got a bunch of cats out there. What you want, you want wolves. You got people out there working together, people in a hunt. That's how you build a cohesive sales team if they embrace accountability. So if you're out there looking to build your sales team to go from good to great to doing the impossible, everybody should embrace and look forward to higher levels of accountability. And guess who loves this? Your best performers. Even though they might say it. Even though they may blurt out that I love the accountability, deep down inside, they know they need accountability. Because it's that accountability that has them show up every day, has them improve, and has them competing with themselves, their peers, the industry, to discover the next best version of themselves. That level of accountability and ownership of their mistakes or successes causes somebody to say, you know what? I'm understanding my next level, and guess what? The best is yet to come. Don't you want those type of people on your sales team? Put it in the comment section below. This is making sense. Put it in the comment section below. Do you want people accountable? Do you want people constant, never ending improvement? Do you want people resilient? So far, what is making sense to you in the first three points? Please put it in the comment section below. And accountability leads me to my fourth point, which is competitive spirit. Let me define it. They are driven to win, hate losing more than they love winning. They're always competing, whether for themselves or others. Listen, you don't need to go no further and see an example of a competitive spirit than our own company. And by the way, we sell insurance. We got a bunch of people in the insurance industry competing in sales, competing in promotions, competing in volume production and overall growth locally, regionally, and nationally. By the way, here's a clip of it. See what you think about competitive spirit with what we're doing in the life insurance industry. Take a look. Have a seat. It's okay. Not a bother. Not a bother. Yes, yes. Oh no, it's no bother at all. It's not like I was about to run another million-dollar agency for five years in a row or carrying out my duties as a newly appointed chief distribution officer of PHP agency. But uh, yes, how may I help you? Oh, oh, oh! What is that? Oh, <laughs> I'm sure. It's just. The kilo of gold we gave our guys last month and some of the silver and stock. And you know, the millions of commissions we paid to our agents just last month. But you know, here at PHP, it's just, it's just not about the money. It's the culture. Yes, the friendly competition. And we compete, oh yes, we compete. But we do so with class and definitely mutual respect. I thought it some shit, didn't I? <laughs> What was that? Chance? Oh, no. No. The life insurance industry. It's very conservative, very subdued. We don't believe in raising our voices, chanting, standing on top of chairs and saying, <sighs> 
So you see, here at PHB Agency, we're quiet. We don't like making a lot of noise going over the top as we disrupt our industry. I mean, in the past, we've had come to our convention, Magic Johnson, Steve Wozniak, the late, great Kobe Bryant, President George W. Bush. We've even had Kevin Hart come by and say hello. Yes. And this year, we have Trey Gowdy as our speaker. General Hard Dog Mattis. And last but not least, Pitbull. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> my apologies. See, here at PHB Agency, we just let the dogs loose. And this week, we begin our first ever virtual online convention. Yes, first time ever in our industry's history. Yes, 13,000 plus expected to attend online. So with that being said, I'm excited and I look forward to seeing many of you there. See, at the end of the day, what makes people better, if you put all those things I just added here to begin with, accountability, resilience, self-improvement, they are expressed in competition. If your people aren't competing or there's too much kumbaya, listen, you don't compete with people below you, you don't people compete with side by side, you compete with people better than you. And you don't get that improvement, you don't get that desire for people who want to be held accountable unless you have a competitive environment. And guess who thrives in competitive environments? People that have a competitive spirit. Now here's the thing, I ask you guys, listen, there's a couple different types of people that compete. People that are vocal about their goals, they're vocal about their standards, they're vocal about the call-outs and what they're about to accomplish. And then what I call my closet competitors. You know, I'm just gonna let my numbers do the talking. You're scared. You're a coward. You know why? There's no accountability in saying, let my numbers do the talking. You gotta be bold enough. You gotta be able to say, stand up and stand down and say, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to declare, I'm gonna kick your tail. I'm going to declare that I'm gonna beat you in the next week, the next month, the next quarter, the next year, I will take number one from you and I'm gonna put myself out there and publicly declare it. I'm not gonna let my numbers do the talk. I would declare my intention and back it up. Here's why. If people keep themselves quiet, I'm only gonna let my numbers do the talking. Well, if you never declare your numbers and you don't know them through, your numbers don't come through to any form of accountability because you fell short. Well, guess what? Shh, shh, nobody knew anyway. That was an out. And maybe that's what you want. You want an out. But if you're bold enough, you're courageous enough to say, listen, I, I'm going to accomplish this. I'm going to kick everybody's tail here. I'm going to eat everybody's lunch and everybody watch me work. Now that person who says that, says that boldly, watch him work. By the way, that reminds me of what we did. We came here to PHB Agency in 2015. I said, who's the top two income earners at this company? We're brand new here. You, you? Okay, I'm taking you guys on. I don't know much about you guys. All I know is I'm inspired by you. I'm honoring you and calling you out in terms of competition, but I'm after you. And guess what happened? 18, 24, 36 months later, my wife and I became the number one income earners in the company. The first two cash flow millionaires in the company. Fast forward, we have over 5,000 agents across the country. We got many sales leaders running their own offices in major cities across the country. Many of them making a million dollars a year, many making $750,000 a year, many making $500,000 a year. But guess what we've established? Why they got the confidence to run their own individual offices. Why? Because they are birthed in a competitive environment. Heroes and leaders are birthed in a competitive environment, not only just through the wins, but more importantly, as I said, stated earlier, also from their losses. So if you want to find gems in your business, you want to find gems in your sales team, make sure they have a competitive spirit. Number five, last but definitely not least, what's this trait that you need to be looking for? Empathy. What? Yes, right. Empathy, let me define it. Empathy is being able to understand and connect with customers, not just focus on closing. To be able to listen and make prospects feel understood. That they build long-term relationships not just quick deals and initial transactions. So your sales team understands that everything grows by word of mouth, they're grown by referrals, they're grown by reputation. And here's the thing too as well as I referenced earlier. We built PHP agency to go from scratch to nearly a $300 million exit and guess how many leads we've ever bought? Zero. We've all been doing our business the last 15 years by word of mouth. 99% 
of our business is done by word of mouth. Sure, we have some advertising out there. Sure, we have some, some flyers and have some community events. But 99% of our business is done by word of mouth, referrals, reputation, being invited to speak at different places, being referred to other folks to help handle their finances, to solve a problem that many people commonly are experiencing themselves. How do we get that? Because we're empathetic to not our needs, to our goals, to our quota, to our commission, but we're empathetic. The best people on a sales team are empathetic to the other person's needs and goals and desires, their pain, their desires for opportunity. An empathetic sales leader will understand that in other folks and maximize it for not just your benefit, but their benefit. That saying says, if you find what other people want and you help them get what they want, guess what eventually people help with you? They'll help you get what you want. I can't tell you how many times I've been on the receiving end of people looking at me as a transaction. People that haven't reached out to me in years. And next thing you know, they want me to introduce them to somebody else that I might not, I might know. And they want me to do business and invest in their deal or program or, or whatever. There's no empathy there. There's no desire. There was no social media connect. There's no networking connections. There's no referral connections. Every time they call me, they're always asking for something. See, empathetic sales leaders understand people's birthdays and anniversaries and key areas in people's lives. And they're there to build a relationship and they're not there just for initial profit, but they're to create long-term value for them and you. So if you want a key trait for somebody to recruit on your team, somebody that understands empathy. A large part of finding the right salespeople, they might have the right traits, but a large part also, if you have an opportunity to interview them, recruit them, start developing and building them, is what do you tell them up front? Because the best relationships in terms of building a sales team is managing expectations up front. If you don't, you compromise that on the back end and surprises come up and people don't like surprises. People like getting their money messed with. So if you help people understand the environment that they're in, the compensation they're going to receive if they sell XYZ, then you have a much better relationship and excitement with your sales team, sales force, and it starts a compounding effort. Then you create an environment of success. With that being said, some of the favorite people I love to hear from and to learn from and see in action is actually college football coaches and how they recruit people, how they recruit talent to their organization, to the program. And on top of it, here's the thing too as well. In spite of the NIL going down in college sports, many of these college football players these days are now getting paid legally for what they do for their college. And so it's causing a lot of coaches how do I differentiate myself even more so to offer this kid more than just a college scholarship? more than just a education. How do I really get them here and retain them here? And a lot of that is managing expectations up front and finding the right people to be in those seats to begin with in the recruitment and hiring process. So let's take a look at a couple of these coaches, what they say about how they view the recruiting process and what they look for. There's two kids I'm trying to recruit. Now, are you hungry or you just want something to eat? Now, now a hungry kid, he gonna make a mayonnaise sandwich, he gonna find a place to play, he gonna call all around to get in the gym, he gonna figure it out. But a kid who wants something to eat, he got a cabinet full of food. He's just sitting at home waiting for somebody to cook it. He ain't trying to cook it. So does he practice? Yeah, because you ask him to. Does he work out? Yeah, because, you you know, like, come on, let's work out. But he ain't hungry. And so when you get to the Division One level, we got to get guys who are hungry. We don't need guys who just want something to eat. But for a parent, parent has to raise you. Only, you're raising one or two kids. You're either raising a, a, a wolf or a sheep. Now, you raise a sheep, you're going to have to protect them all the time. And that's what's happening with parents. They want to protect their kids all the time because that's a sheep. You always got to protect the sheep. You can't never leave a sheep alone. That's what it is. But a wolves will find other wolves will find some way to eat. And they have to realize that because struggle builds character. They're trying to take away the struggle and there's no character being built in them. Uh, by the way, great point here with this coach. You're looking for salespeople with character. I believe the five different traits here were veiled character. You're looking for character. And how, by the way, if you're looking for high skill, low character, guess what? You're going to find somebody with a revolving door and then create cancerous attitudes and behaviors in your sales team. Matter of fact, person with low character, high skill might leave and try to recruit and poach your guys to create a new movement to his own company or, or another company that they're recruiting people to. However, if you hire people that have high character, low skill set, and specifically in your industry, it may come from some other industry that you have to teach them the skills that I'd rather you do that. Do you know why? Character can teach. You can always teach skill. So if you're able to find somebody with high character, choice that you're looking for upfront, guess what you can always teach? 
boom. And here's the thing too as well. We're leaving that by personal example because 99% of the people that recruit into our insurance agency has no financial services or life insurance industry experience. That's right. We hire coaches. We hire former athletes. We hire veterans. We hire disgruntled employees who are overlooked and underpaid and underappreciated. Teachers are perfect for us. Nurses are perfect for us because they care about others and care about the teaching process that enlighten other people's lives because like helping people. These folks do very well with us. And here's the thing. They have high character. We will always teach skill. And by the way, life insurance sales skills is very easy to teach especially on the job but here's what we can't teach we can't teach character all right this next clip is my favorite interview on the seven figure squad youtube channel which is coach Dion sanders prime time so what does he do in terms of recruiting players at this time in this clip to jackson state let's take a look at this clip how do you teach your kids to handle the expectations around here well we didn't recruit them not thinking they could we recruited them because they told us uh, we identified the characteristic characteristics that they wanted to go to the next level. We're not recruiting guys or signing guys or having guys inside this locker room that don't want it all. If you just want to play football, this ain't a place for you. But if you want to go pro and be a professional and dominate and learn this game within the game and the game of life as well, this is the spot for you. But if you just want to play football, you can do that in parking lot. Is that your pitch to kids? No, I don't pitch, first and foremost. I sit down and tell the truth, the unequivocal truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I, I'm a straight shooter. See, most of these parents are my age right. or a little bit younger. So they know how I get down and they know what I'm saying to them is genuine. I'm not promising them nothing but opportunity. Back to managing expectations up front. This is Coach Prime. He's doing the same thing just at the collegiate athletic level. The same thing can be done with your solar company. The same thing can be done with your real estate company. The same thing can be done with your chiropractic or your life insurance or your construction company. You can apply these skill sets that these elite coaches and elite entrepreneurs are using in sports or in other industries to find people the right traits to build up and scale your team to have an exponential growth curve. And speaking of Coach Prime, there's another clip of him specifically looking for positions that he's looking for in terms of the environments that we're raised in. He caught a lot of heat for what he has to say. I'm just curious, what do you think about what Coach Prime here has to say about recruiting certain kids from different family environments to specific positions on the football team? Let's take a look at this. Like old linemen, I look for dual parent homes, right. a strong father that they adhere uh, to. Right. Um, my defense lineman is totally opposite. What do you mean? Single mama, <laughs> 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 wow. trying to get it. Uh, he's on free lunch. I mean, like, uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking about just trying to make. By the way, with Coach Prime, you agree? You don't agree? Please put it in the comment section. But either agree or don't agree with his approach on recruiting certain position players from different family environments to be playing on his football team. All right, we discussed the easy part. Now let's go to the hard part. By the way, some of y'all, some sales leaders, some CEOs, some execs out there, you have a hard time having tough conversations. And yet you're a VP, you're a director, you're a C-suite executive. You have a hard time having crucial conversations with people, especially if you're finding out they're not a fit for your organization or a fit for your sales team. They might find a different position elsewhere. And by the way, here's a book recommendation for you, Crucial Conversations. Crucial conversations. We, our team, uh, our company read that whole entire book for an entire month. And what we got from that book is the approach for people to have empathy, to have the right scripts, to have, do you think you have need scripts for sales? We need scripts for having crucial conversations. The thing that a lot of people don't do these days is have crucial conversations to better improve the organization, the team, the company, et cetera. Having these crucial conversations helps you get the expectations up front because one of the most frustrating things that anybody can deal with is what? Unmet expectations. And that's where crucial conversations are needed. And one of those crucial conversations are much needed up front in the recruitment and sales process along the way during performance reviews. So here's five key traits of people that you need to avoid at all costs for them to be on your sales team. Number one, they are a drifter. What is a drifter? Let me define this. It's someone who's easily swayed by others because they lack a clear focus in life. They're constantly hopping from job to job. They're running away from problems and never staying long enough to grow. How many times do you come across somebody's business card and three months later they have a different business card and six months later they have a different business card or you go on their LinkedIn profile, this, 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 never holding a job for more than a year, more than two years and they have a long resume of failures. Now they may be proud about their long history and you have to ask that in your recruitment and interview process, why do they have so many different jobs? 
And by the way, here's some language I'm gonna tell you. It was everybody else's problem but theirs. Drifters are great blamers. It is everybody else's fault but them. They don't take ownership of the lack of success in their career. They don't take ownership of the lack of success in the previous company or companies. By the way, good book recommendation, Outwitting the Devil. It was this interview that this author of the book was having with the devil. And here's what the devil looks for in terms of attacking. They attacked the drifter. Not the person that was solid on their expectations, solid on their beliefs, solid in the commitment. Solid. That's why you love people that vocalize what they're looking to do. And at the same time, vo those that vocalize what they do, but they drift, those are the people to then avoid to avoid. That's why I love people with the competitive spirit and you bring them out of their shell. But the devil in that book says, I love the drifters because they never make a decision to do anything great in their life. They just boom, 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 boom. Next thing you know, six months later here, 12 months later here, three years later here, and they look back 10 years of life, nothing accomplished. They've been spinning their wheels. They're in this economic financial rat race. I got nothing to show for, but they got everything to owe for and it's everybody else's fault. So if there's somebody to avoid on your sales team is the drifter. The second person you need to avoid, this trait you need to avoid at all costs, is the blamer. And what does the blamer do? The blamer is always pointing fingers at others. They blame the leads, they blame the product, they blame the company, they blame the system instead of taking personal responsibility. And guess what? If they're on your team, and they're lacking success, eventually what are you gonna do with you? Hey boss, hey CEO, hey VP of sales, the reason I'm not successful is because of you. You're the leader, right? You're the leader, you're not helping me become a better salesperson. You're not helping me become a better sales leader, or sales manager, it's your fault. Well, true, but what about their fault? What about their ownership of the situation? What about their ownership of their lack of success? What about their ownership of not personally developing and improving professionally and, and, and personally? Where are they at in the whole process? See, these folks I love to avoid, and by the way, in this day and age, so easy to identify, thanks to social media, thanks to Twitter, thanks to status updates. Do you know why? A lot of these blamers, they like to talk about you through passive aggressive means. They go on social media, they tell everybody about why they're not happy besides who? You. So if you find a person on your sales team that has this trait, okay, they might be successful, you might be bringing in some revenue, but this person, do you really bring into your inner circle? Does this person you see that you can invest into for the long term? I don't know. Third person that displays these traits. What are these traits? Lazy? yet ambitious. Gotta watch out for these folks. Oh yeah, let me define it. They always talk big, but they really avoid the hard work. They want and thrive in quick wins and shortcuts, and they're always looking for finding ways to make easy money. And here's the thing too as well. Some of the most prolific, lazy and ambitious people, guess what they're also good at doing? Drifting and blaming. They go hand in hand. Some of the most dangerous people you'll ever run across are people that are lazy and ambitious. They want the title, they want the cash flow, they want the recognition, they want the promotion, but they're unwilling to do it. They got the talent though. They got everything going for them, but guess what they're not doing? They're not working hard. They're just making the bare minimum or they're just barely making it to begin with. These are the people at the top of the void because guess what they're very good at doing? You know what they're very good at doing? Recruiting. They're very good at recruiting people to their camp and their woe is me disposition. And then they feed them that language. And they say, you know, they talk it to another person in another department. To talk to this other part in another company. These are the folks that you got to avoid. You cannot invest any time, any money, any resource to somebody that's lazy and ambitious. Now, ambitious, I get. But you gotta get over that lazy part. And here's the thing about changing people. You wanna find out how to create an enemy? Try changing them. Try molding them to something they don't want to become. That's how you create an enemy. Folks, especially in sales, some of these folks, if they're gonna drift somewhere, have them drift away. On the recruiting process, how do you identify lazy and ambitious people? Have them talk about the last sales job. Have them talk about the last company they're with. Very easy company. For example, in our, in our business, we easily get phone calls from a lot of people. Yeah, I'm come, calling from this company, I'm calling from this company. Great, you got a license, awesome. Why are you leaving? Well, this, this, and that. Well, what do you want to accomplish? I'm like $500,000 a year. I'm like a million dollars a year. Great. What have you done in the last 90 days? Nothing. So you want a lot of income and results from your business, but you're really doing nothing. At least come here with, a, with some momentum. Come here with some success at your previous company. But you're not. You come here with a lot of excuses why you're not winning. This is clear. Clearly somebody's identified themselves as lazy and ambitious. This trait, the sales skill set, got to avoid. Which leads me to number four. All talk, no action. Yes, all talk. No action. Matter of fact, let's call it NATO. No action, talk only. <laughs> Let me define it. They're smooth talkers who impress in interviews, but really fail to deliver. And there's no follow through on their promises. So a lot of these folks here in this position, 
of all talk, they pa 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 pa. They're very good with uh, word salad. They got very pretty words. And you doing the interview process, and your hiring process, or your evaluation process, explain to them what they're looking for. What are they looking to accomplish in their life? What are they looking to accomplish with this career? What's their big goals? What are they excited about? And guess what? You're gonna find a lot of people who uh, spent five, 10, 15, 20 years in sales that really never accomplished anything significant. You know what they're showing you evidence of? Talk, 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 but no action, action, action. They go from job to job to job to job to job. And by the way, there's so many, so many out there. And so you have to avoid those folks on their way in or if they're already in there. No action, talk only, gotta avoid these people to invest in them on a long-term basis. Which leads me to my last one, clout chaser. Let me define what a clout chaser is. They're obsessed with the image and looking successful. Focuses on appearances over actual performance. Now here's the thing with cloud chasers. They're very impressive. You might see them with the right photo op, the right handshake, the right gift they're giving to somebody on stage, or a gift they give in front of a group of people. They hijack a whole meeting for them to give a gift to the organizer, the CEO, in front of everybody, making a lot of other people feel uncomfortable, but strokes the ego of somebody that they're trying to get their attention is great. And that person makes the mistake of what? Bringing them into their inner circle, because they're chasing a client, guess what eventually that happens to that person. Once they're done absorbing that person's clout, they're moving on to the next person to give them even further clout. So these type of folks, they're only in it for what you can give them right now. Now, I know some people out there say, well, Matt, is it about sales and is it about self-interest and what's in it for me? I totally get it. But it's also lacking class. It's also lacking somebody that you've invested a lot of time and resources in and recognition and, and honoring in the process just for them to just absorb your clout absorb your recognition just to move on to something else and along the process, because since you've given them edification, since you've given them recognition, everybody feels that this type of person they need to follow to as well. Wrong, they're just a clout chaser. So in your process of being a sales leader, you gotta be careful to somebody who's doing this, doing this, doing this, and they're rising, right? They're hitting them quotas, they're getting recognition, but they're just showing they're just doing it for clout. They're using the position for the wrong elements for the own deep, deep down, dark, deep secrets for things that are definitely not on your agenda, but only on them. They're not sharing with anybody else but themselves. You gotta be watch out. You gotta be watching out for these clout chasers out there because they're completely in a position to hurt you on a long-term basis if you edify this type of person long-term. And next thing you know, if they leave, they do something, they do something weird, odd, and they put it on social media and now they're attracting your salespeople, you're attracting your staff. And your team's like, well, weren't you, giving them, like, weren't you giving them some recognition? Didn't you believe in them because you kept bringing them up? It's your fault. Now it's on you. So anybody that's chasing clout, I totally get it. But make sure they're aligned with your purpose, aligned with the company, aligned with the, the vision and the mission you have for your organization. And by the way, if you don't have that, get one. Because you know what you're going to attract a lot of them? A lot of clout chasers. But you want to have a vision and a mission for your company, you're going to attract true believers. So which would you have to have? True believers or cloud chasers? Put it in the comment section below. So Matt, you said, well Matt, how do I know who is who? Three ways to know who is who. Number one is time. Second one is competition. And by the way, well, here's what I love about competition. Like, Matt, I don't got the time. I know, that's why you need to run sales contests. How come? Because competition compresses time. Competition said, listen, instead of me finding out who you are in 12 months, let's run a competition here for the next 30 days. And within inside those 30 days, I want to see how everybody acts and performs this week, this week, this week, this week, to see what they do in 30 days. Okay, somebody goes out there and says, oh, I thought you were a lot uh, better performer than I thought you were. We'll give them another 30 days. That's why I love competition. If they, if they come through, they, bad one month, good one month, next month, third, see, what, see what's going to happen in that third month. That's part of your evaluation process to find out who is who. And here's the real thing too as well, is you're building and growing your organization. Time is going to be your best friend. And depending on what type of sales organization you have, whether it's salary or salary commission or 100% commission. By the way, I'm curious, for those of you watching this video, who are you looking to hire? Salary plus commission, salary only, or 100% commission? Put it in the comment section below. Salary commission, salary only, or commission only? Put it in the comment section below. Who are you looking to recruit and hire for your company? And the third one is gonna expose you, the real traits of them, is client and coworker feedback. Be an undercover boss and ask, your staff, ask your customers how they feel about working with John Smith. Ask them how they feel their experience was working with that person that represents your company, your brand, your service. Ask them and they'll share with you their experience. Their character will go out into the marketplace and as a boomerang effect, it's gonna bring you either the positive traits for somebody you invest in for the long term or sadly the negative traits. And from there going forward, you gotta deal with that information and have yourself then a crucial conversation. But if you really wanna find out who wins long term, 
ask your clients, ask your coworkers, ask them for the feedback on this particular person. So as a wrap up, consider these three points. Focus on hiring those who are resilient, accountable, and empathetic. Avoid the jumpers, the blamers, and the cloud chasers. And recruit wisely, and you build yourself a killer sales team. That being said, I want to know what you take away from this episode. There's some traits that you like to add to this mix. Please put it in the comment section below. That being said, make sure you subscribe to the 7 Fear Squad YouTube channel, a YouTube channel dedicated to help you think like a millionaire, strategize like a millionaire, so therefore you can be a first generation cash flow millionaire in your faith, in your finance, in your ability to build a sales team. That being said, hope you enjoyed it until we meet again. Continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Mm-hmm.